Gentlemen, we have called you together to inform you that we are going to overthrow the United States government. You still think that jet fuel brought down the World Trade Center? Does anybody else see a problem here? If the government has nothing to hide. Or parapsychology, or ESP in those days. A number of those reports um, prepared as far as our analysis of Eastern Europe that were eventually released under Freedom of Information Act um, are posted on our website. And you can go and look there and you'll see hundreds of pages of these declassified documents. They're heavily redacted. I mean, a lot's blacked out. But you get a general sense of what we were doing. And here's what they discovered. And, and it's not in the published work. It's not in the other videos. It's not in that material. But here's the conclusions after all of it. And I, and I met the Northwest Field Director, got to know him real well over the years of the Mankind Research Association, the kind of stuff they were doing back in the 70s. And he kept his data. He's got a great box of data uh, talking about all of these experimentations. And, and, and what they concluded was that A, extrasensory perceptions, these odd little things that people could do, were real. Not in all instances, but in enough instances to cause them some alarm, military planners. Because what also they discovered is that human beings generally have these innate capabilities that we used to call extrasensory perception. Some have referred to as gifts of the spirit. They come by a lot of different names. But what they are is natural attributes of what human beings are. We're created in the image of a creator. That means more than how we look. It has to do with what we are. And what we are are very capable individuals. But in order to reach those higher capabilities, in order to reach those higher states of awareness, in order to actualize your full potential as a human being, you have to be able to slow the mind. You have to be able to create a situation where the mind, if you were to look at it with an EEG and look at the brain activity, you get very coherent very rhythmic patterns, the kind associated with the emotions of love and empathy and compassion, same kind of patterns show up. Higher ordered thinking is associated with these coherent patterns, these rhythmic patterns. Fear, flight responses, anger, hate, you get incoherent patterns all over the map at a higher amplitude, at a higher pulse rate uh, that, that indicate agitation, confusion, the inability to think. What we do know is that in, in states of fear, worry, and anxiety, you cannot, you cannot ever reach your higher capacity as a human being. So the easiest mind control technique, keep people in a state of fear and worry and agitation, and we're defeated before the first volley is fired. Uh, that's not what we need to be about. You know, it's, it, when you think about it, when you're walking confidently, consciously doing what you know you're capable of doing, how empowering it is to step into each act that you take on as a human being uh, in a productive and meaningful way, without fear, without worry. It's when your mind falls into what some call that zone that the athlete knows and the artist knows and every one of us knows in those instances where those sparks of creativity come through. That is our normal state of consciousness. If you're to look at it in the lower range of the alpha range where you are in that most creative mindset, you'd be between seven and eight, seven and nine hertz pulses per second. The planet naturally oscillates at 7.83 hertz pulses per second. Isn't that interesting? Correlates perfectly with the ideal state for awake, conscious, living, when you're awake. And yet the fields that we surround ourselves with in this room right now, in every room where everyone's watching this because the power grid is operating at 60 hertz, 60 pulses per second, an agitating signal all the time in our background noise, if you will, our noise. Because think about it, in a crowded room, all the noise you hear and you're having a conversation with your friend and you block out all that background noise. We do the same thing with electromagnetic fields. I'll tell you when you notice it. I couldn't use this analogy in Germany. I'll, t I'll tell you why in a minute. 
But think about when the power fails in your community, when the power goes out, completely goes out, the power grid's down, now everybody remembers it given all the winter storm activity. And the first thing you notice how quiet it is, because the refrigerator's not humming along, the air conditioner or the heaters aren't blowing, blowing air around. The second thing you notice is how your whole body <sighs> exhales as you relax. Same feeling when you come in from a hard day of work and you're wearing your insulated soles on your shoes and the first thing you do is you kick them off and you come back into ground with the pulse rate of the planet and you relax. That relaxation is the silence. Do you know what the sound of being born into an explosion is? Silence. We're living in that explosion in the fields that surround us every moment of every day. When I use that analogy this last year in Stuttgart, everybody looked at me like I was crazy when I said, you know when the power fails. It never fails in Germany. People with gray hair never remember a power failure since World War II ended. <laughs> you know, I mean, we don't even think about that. I mean, you talk about the contrast in technology. I can't even use the same analogy in Europe because it doesn't make sense. Uh, because our technology happens to run smoother. And we invented the power grid for all practical purposes. But again, you know, I, I say it humorously, but at the same time recognizing under all this are these very real effects that we have to recognize. So how do you learn how to control you? You know, people ask me all the time, you know, you talk about a lot of technologies generate a lot of concern, um, some levels of anxiety. That's not my intention. My intention is to inform so we can begin to think about this stuff in a productive, constructive way and how we address it. But more importantly, the more important part of this message and, uh, and anything that I've said um, in the last couple of days is, is about the fact that we are more than we think we are. There are no small things. There's only things that are undone. Each thing that we do as individuals matters. It matters a lot, more than you might even realize or recognize. And there are no small things. And what I do versus what you do, it's not a size issue. It's getting the work done. All of us have a sphere of influence, and we need to assert ourselves in that sphere of influence. What that means is it might mean that we have a conversation with our family or our close friends. We don't feel any anxiety having done that. When the anxiety creeps in, back off. Think about what you're doing. It should be like breathing if you're working outside of fear and outside of worry, and you're working in a way that is possible, where you acknowledge it's possible. Do what you know you can do to further your version and your view of the truth, and do it in a respectful way, uh, and do it with confidence. And don't lift the burden if it's too heavy. There's someone else that will lift it for you, or lift it with you. But do something. Uh, in favor of what you believe to be right and true, whether it's on any of the issues we've covered today or on some other issue, but something that you care about and recognize there's a billion other people doing the same thing, and we're not waiting for an organization to form. We're already standing in it. It's called the human race. Participate in it. Be what you were created to be, and assert yourself in the world today by affecting change, by direct action, in a respectful and rational way. Uh, and without fear and without worry, because that is the zone in which things can happen. Fear is the adversary. It has always been the adversary, and it's the easiest method of controlling human behavior. When you think of the whole 1984 scenarios, which, which I think are here now, I mean, certainly are here now on, on steroids. I mean, those guys are rolling over in their grave because it's a lot worse than they thought. Um, Huxley, you know, he wrote Brave New World. And the essay most people missed of his was one of the very last ones he wrote, um, which was Brave New World Revisited. When he went back and sort of looked at it and said, oh, no, it's 40 years ahead of where I thought it was. Now, this is in the late 1950s, and I think he died in 62 or 63. So the very end of his life, and the things that are the most important to read aren't what somebody wrote earlier in their career. It's what they wrote at the end, sort of how they evaluate. You know, when I look at um, studying someone's work, I start with the last thing they wrote and work my way backwards, because there's the pinnacle of their knowledge. And Huxley's pinnacle of the knowledge was the last warning, the last shout in the movie theater saying, hey, it's 40 years ahead of the game, 
And it probably isn't going to be chemistry that does it. It's going to be something else. And it's the electronics of this century. It's the tools that we've been talking about misapplied to the population. Those are the things that are causing Huxley today to roll over in his grave because even that warning was 40 years too old. I mean, that warning in the late 50s and his conclusion then was nothing compared to what has emerged in the 21st century and what came out of the last of the last century. This technology to change not just our emotional states but the way we perceive the world is already exists on the planet. New breakthroughs are being anticipated by military planners. This last year, 2010, DARPA let two contracts, the University of California, for developing methods and means for creating electronic telepathy, where we can electronically transfer thoughts um, into, the, into the mind of another person in a way that they cannot distinguish the artificial from their own. Now think about that in the 21st century. If you can create a complete memory set, one of the stated goals of Air Force planners, to complete a complete memory set that you cannot distinguish the real from the fiction, is that the witness you want on your trial in the courts of the 21st century? The guy who can swear by that memory and yet that memory is as false as a three dollar bill. That's the technology of this century. It'll challenge the very institutions that we depend on for justice, for liberty, for freedom, synthetic memory. It's being even played off in terms of Gulf War syndrome and in terms of the uh, shock that people come out of the war with. You know, the shock, the fear, the memories, the uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome that, that boils out of these war efforts. And so what are we hearing about? ways to wipe the memory clean so people can forget all those bad experiences. Do they really go away or do they just get driven deeper into the subconscious where they do their real work at breaking down the consciousness of a human being where they can't get played out, they can't get worked out, they get suppressed and suppressed conflicting ideas are the root to a lot of the psychosis we see in the world today. This is the solution to military planners wipe out the memory of the gladiator so they don't know what they did and somehow that will excuse the behavior and save that person's soul uh, no it won't um, it'll mask the pain and let it break out in some weird irrational way because that's what happens when you suppress these kinds of memories secondly maybe we want these guys to remember what they did because maybe some of the things that they were directed to do they shouldn't have done in the first place Maybe the memories that they have of the abuses that we inflict on others are memories that somebody ought to be testifying to, to someday instead of bearing because now we have a technology that can mask the behavior of our troops in combat. That's not the answer. In the, in the past wars, the wars that our fathers fought and our grandfathers fought, when they returned from battle, the stench of death was still in their noses and they worked hard to avoid wars in future wars to save the next generation from experiencing the same trauma they did. Trauma is the outcome of war but it also makes us as human beings resist war, make it our last effort not our first effort. If we take it out we make it neutral where there's no pain, there's no residual memory, it becomes easier and easier to fl inflict war on others. It becomes easier and easier to use that as the solution rather than diplomacy uh, and fair play. Is that what we want? Is that the reflection of American values we want our military paranoid closet planners to engage in for us? Or do we want them to uphold the values, instill those values on other, the next generation of military planners so that American values are what's projected to the world by our example? Um, not by our hidden agenda. You know, thinking about Alaska st strategically, and most Americans don't, but let's, let's talk about Alaska just for a minute and, and how this feeds in to what's happening around the world. Firstly, Alaska is 18% of all the land in the United States. It has a greater coastline, Alaska alone. If you take all the western states, all the west coast, 
all the East Coast, and all the Gulf Coast, and you add it all up, Alaska's coastline is bigger.